Thanks so much, everybody. Uh, welcome to Build. I am your host, Ricky Camilleri, and um, everything in moderation, right? Except plants. In the new recipe book, Mostly Plants, Tracy, Dana, Lori, and Corky Pollen present 101 flexitarian recipes, which means they mostly involve plants, but also every now and then throw in some meat, some carbs, and they are here now to talk about it with us. Please welcome Corsi, Corky, Tracy, Dana, and Lori Pollen. Hey. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I love this book uh, because it starts with just a brief bit of each one of yours uh, journey to what kind of diet you have now. And I think two of you are vegetarians currently and two of you are flexitarians. Uh, forgive me, I don't remember which two. Vegetarian, <laughs> uh, vegetarian, 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 flexitarian. flexitarian. And flexitarian. But you, you know, you started, you grew up in the 30s and 40s where you were basically given meat for dinner every night and you kind of raised your family that way as well. When did you start seeing that involving more vegetables and having meat a little bit less was important? Well, I think when the girls started turning out to be vegetarian, then I sort of changed the way that I was cooking and really making a lot more of the vegetables and a lot less of meat that would land on our plates. And uh, I think that uh, for me, it just uh, w seemed the right way to eat. Uh, and I am a flexitarian today. No, I would have to ask after 40 so some odd years, right, of you know, yeah. eating meat on a daily basis, uh, starting to eat a little bit more like a vegetarian, flexitarian, how did you find it made you feel? Well, I was finding that eating meat just wasn't agreeing with me. The last time I had a burger, when I finished it, I really felt a little sick. Yeah. So that uh, going um, totally uh, to, uh, or mainly to vegetables, just made me feel so much better. I think you get out, uh, away from the table and you're just feeling healthier and lighter. And for me, it made a lot of sense. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. As a person who grew up eating burgers all the time, having reached a point where a burger for me is solely a treat that is an almost once a month experience, I find that I crave it and then I have it and I go, oh, I do not need that again. It's like a, it becomes an immediate hangover of some kind. Like, I don't need to feel this bad after a meal ever again. That was tasty while I ate it, though. Uh, you talk about how you were a vegetarian for quite some time, correct? And then you went back to eating meat a little bit, or did I, am I yes, mis Yes, exactly. No, that? I was vegetarian from the age of 15, straight through my first pregnancy. And then I became pregnant with twins. And, and I've always loved vegetables. I, I was always the person who could sit down, make a tray of roasted vegetables, and just eat them all myself. Um, when I became pregnant with twins, I started to slowly crave meat, which was so odd, and I didn't quite understand it. And, um, and I kind of went through to the end of the pregnancy, and then I just, I, I had to. And I think that what happened was because it was a twin pregnancy and there were some complications, I don't think I could get enough iron. I don't think I knew enough then about other sort of plant-based sources of iron. So I started to, to kind of slowly reintroduce meat into my diet. And I think that I decided to just kind of keep it slightly in my diet is because I was so rigidly vegetarian. I would I would ask if anything had any kind of, you know, stocks had meat in it or, or Oreo cookies at the time I wouldn't eat. And I just didn't, yeah, it had lard in it oh, right. back in the day. Yeah. And, um, and so I kind of liked not being so particular. About you wanted to go diet. back to being a fun person. Exactly. I was, <laughs> exactly. You wanted to stop noticing your friends roll their eyes every now and then at you. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. I, I found as well that when you take that really long break from me and you go back to it just a little bit, you have a completely different kind of respect for eating meat. Um, and I mean respect in the sense that you don't take it for granted right, anymore. Right, exactly. Yeah. Now, the two of you are vegetarians. How long have you been vegetarians? Most of uh, I've been a vegetarian since I was 16 years old. Yeah, and I started when I was 13, ate it again, and stopped eating it for good when I was 19. Wow. How's that going? <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine living any other way, actually. I'm very used to it, and I know now how to eat legumes and whole grains and um, beans, tofu. And so I don't miss anything, actually. 
And for me, you know, I write about this in the book. I was a, and still am a huge animal lover. And um, so for me, growing up, I would constantly think we had a pet pig uh, named Kosher. And I loved eating bacon, but there came a point where it's like, something's wrong with this picture. I kept thinking about what I was eating, this cuddly, cute animal. So I just <laughs> gave it up. I uh, love this And pig. I never looked back. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> How often do the four of you, I mean, the, the recipes here come from the four of you in many different ways. I imagine some of you did research on some, some of you, all of the four of you did together. How often do the four of you get together and cook together and have, have meals together? Often. We do that often. Uh, when we were writing the book, sometimes we would break up into uh, twos, pairs of twos. It was easier in some ways to cook together that way. But we do get together and cook um, on weekends often, the four of us. And it will be a family meal, and the larger family will get together and participate. What were some of the rules that you set out for yourselves when it came to coming up with the recipes for this book? What kind of, um, what parameters did you want to stay within? Well, I think we were really cognizant of people don't have a lot of time in the kitchen. I mean, everyone's working really hard. So what was really important is coming together with recipes where they just, you know, took anywhere from 35 to 45 minutes, um, you know, any time you would cook. Uh, and also just, I mean, again, we all eat very healthy. This is mostly plants. So the focus was on vegetables, whole grains, legumes, fruit, nuts, and seeds. And, um, yeah, we would just brainstorm and think about, okay, what do we want to eat? What do we think other people are going to want to eat? What ingredients we were really interested in? And then we would put together a recipe. You know, one of the other elements of the book, it's not just recipes. You talk a little bit about what's in your pantry and what how people can cook better and what they should sort of have around. So it's not just like, here's a recipe, go buy the things for this recipe, make that. What can you keep in your home on a regular basis? And how can you know more about food? What does it mean to be vegan? What does it mean to be vegetarian? When, along the lines of cr writing this book, did you find that you should incorporate all of those elements rather than just recipes? Well, I think we wanted to make something that was very accessible to everybody. All of the three of us have children who are in their teens or 20s, and they're starting households sometimes. They're at college or somewhere. We thought about them. What do they need to start cooking and knowing how to eat healthy? And so we made pantry lists that you can throw together a dinner. You get home late from classes. You get home late from work. You can throw together a dinner in 35 minutes. And so there's certain staples that if you have them, you can put together something delicious. I'm going to ask you to explain something that's in the book that it's a term that I've heard, heard used around me a lot. I still don't get it, even after reading your page in the book. <laughs> and that is umami. Okay, that's... That's interesting that you don't get it after reading the book, which uh -oh. <laughs> we may need to clarify. <laughs> I don't think it's your fault. I think there's something going on up here. So umami is the fifth taste, and um, that is the taste, and that's why so many people crave meat, love eating meat, because it is that earthy, meaty taste. But what, um, what the thing that makes vegetables delicious sometimes is adding that umame flavor. So we talk about the different ingredients that you can add to just kind of up that earthiness and, and deliciousness of vegetables. So things like mushrooms or a mushroom broth or soy sauce. If you do eat fish, anchovies, add, add that, miso. So any of those kind of like, I always call them sort of bottom heavy flavors add that delicious, rich umami flavor. So it's like an earthy flavor mm -hmm. that can not necessarily substitute meat, but can substitute like a, a part of the craving that somehow. And round meat. out the flavor so you have that full body yeah. taste. Do you suggest that, and, and one of the things about this book is that it's not a suggestion book. You're not making very direct recommendations about how people should live their lives. But as vegetarians and flexitarians and as someone who lived as a vegetarian for quite some time and someone who ate meat for every night for a number of years of their life. Do you recommend that people, in order to become flexitarians or better flexitarians, remove meat from their lives for, for a little bit or at least attempt? No. You say no. No. Uh, we, what we wanted to get across in the book and the flexitarian, it's very flexible. And you do what works for you. Some people would be daunted if you said to them, you can't eat meat you know, for a month and then go into this because you, you just might quit. 
because you're out somewhere or you're craving. So we really say do what works for you. If that means being vegetarian one, two, three nights a week, do that. If it means eating meat every day, but making it two ounces rather than a you know ten ounce steak. So I mean, most Americans at this moment like eat meat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It's a terrible diet. Yes, <laughs> it's really bad for the environment. I mean, that's the big thing. There's a huge positive benefit to cutting down on meat, and we're really big believers in Meatless Monday which is the idea of going meatless at least one day a week. And that can have a huge significant um, effect in terms of you know, the water waste. I mean, we waste billions of gallons of water with the production of meat um, and also greenhouse gases. We really reduce that tremendously. So that's another great reason why you should eat less meat. You know, oftentimes uh, when you tell someone that you're a vegetarian or that you're eating less meat, they say, well, how do you get protein? Right, and how do you get iron, for instance? What are what are some of the ways people can get those? Can substitute uh, meat or sub have some kind of substitute for iron or protein instead of meat? Do you want oh, to take that? Yes. Well, there are vegetables that can be high uh, in uh, protein. I think if you eat um, six or eight clams, you're getting as much protein as if you ate a steak. Uh, this is seafood, of course, but there are vegetables that are high also in protein. Uh, if you eat uh, legumes, you'll get proteins uh, from uh, that. And uh, so many of the vegetables are so high in minerals. And uh, Beets, chickpeas, right? Those yes, are good protein substitutes. Yes, besides being high in protein, uh, they're very, very filling, so you eat less of them. So it's great if you're trying to lose weight. Uh, there are so many vegetables that are, are fabulous to keep the weight down also. I'm a big fan of roasting chickpeas. That's oh, like, yes. Delicious. Yeah, very, very <laughs> also, good. like if you look at the cover of our book, that just looks like a green salad, mm -hmm. but we add edamame to it. Yeah. which has a lot of protein. So, you know, there's just so many simple ways to kind of round out but that vegetarian diet. I also think, um, I mean, I wasn't aware of this until probably the last few years, but, you know, broccoli and kale and mushrooms, they all have a lot of protein. So you can get everything you need by eating just plants. I think there's this belief that, oh, I need to eat my meat, I need to eat my chicken to get protein, but you can get it all from just plants. I had an experience where last year, and this is going to sound like a brag, and I'm really sorry, but last year I ran, I ran the New York City Marathon, and as I was training for it, my partner, I know, I'm really sorry, but as I was, I was training for months for it, and my partner said, you know, you're going to, I'm just going to feed you vegetables, and I was like, no, I'm going to need protein, she goes, don't worry about it, you're going to eat vegetables only, you're going to go vegetarian for training for the race, and you're going to get all your protein. And I never questioned it. I never asked what was giving me the protein. I just <laughs> ate what she fed me, and it totally worked out. And anytime someone was like, where are you getting your protein from? She would be like, edamame or mushrooms. I like, I'm, or, you know, I'm cooking. He gets his carbs from the rice, all of these things, and it worked out perfectly. And you would think, I think most people would assume while you're training, you need heavy, you need heavy meat all the time. But you don't. It actually kind of weighs you down. Yeah. Yeah. What is it like when the four of you get in the kitchen together? It's fun. <laughs> we really, yeah. We, who's the I boss? <laughs> who's the boss? I think um, whoever's house it is would uh, be uh, <laughs> a little more of the boss. We but sort of share. We sure. have specialties, I think, that we each do. So I think yeah. just we just very evenly seem to divide and yeah. conquer. Do you have a favorite recipe in the book? Um, me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I thought I you were going to say, do you have a favorite daughter? <laughs> and I was like... <laughs> We'll get to that next. Yeah. <laughs> What's she going to say? I don't know. I'm warming you up the for the big question. Gone. Yeah. But now that you bring it up, what? Uh... There are a number of favorite, and sometimes it changes uh, with the season. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes in winter, it might be one of the soups that I love most. I just crave uh, soups when it's really cold out. And in spring and summer, I think it would uh, might be uh, some of the salads. Uh, there are a couple of the flexitarian recipes that I'm very, very fond of. There's a Turkish spiced chicken where I love the flavors and the fact that uh, even the vegetables have these wonderful flavors. So those are some of my favorites. Do you have a favorite recipe? 
You know, you just mentioned soup. And one thing that when we were all vegetarians that we never got to eat was French onion soup, which is always a huge favorite of ours. And so our mom developed this vegetarian French onion soup where she just cooks down the onions and it gets all of that umami flavor. So to be able to have a completely vegetarian on French onion soup, that was, you know, so that still is probably one of my favorites. Is French onion normally not vegetarian? Is it, it cooked with meat broth? Usually, uh, yeah, veal and, be and a veal style. or meat broth. That's classically what it's made from, and many people feel you need that to get uh, really the flavor of a French onion soup, but ours is amazing, uh, just made with onions and some vegetable stock. Oh, that sounds incredible. Yeah. Do you have a, what are your favorite uh, recipes? You know, it changes. Um, the other night I made the spinach, mushroom, and feta cutlets and um, served those with mango chutney, and we have a recipe for mango chutney in the cookbook. And those I love. It's sort of savory with the cutlets, but then you have the mango chutney, which is sweet and um, really good and really satisfying. And again, for people who eat meat, when they're craving that burger, <laughs> it's almost like a burger, mm -hmm. um, but yeah. That one's my favorite right now. I did beet burgers for a little while when Ooh, I was craving burgers. That probably was yeah. delicious. Yeah, it's pretty good. You know, yeah. mix it with a little egg and roll it up and right. roast it and then grill it. Yeah. yeah. Sounds great. Pretty good. Um, you know, as a vegetarian, um, sometimes I love a dinner that's just a bunch of side dishes. Mm -hmm. And we have a couple things. We have um, these chickpeas that are roasted with cheese, and they're just... You, you put down a bowl of them and they're like they're so addictive. People just go crazy over them. We also have this um, smashed potatoes with Brussels sprouts. And what I love about this dish is sometimes people have this feeling they don't want to eat too many potatoes or simple carbohydrate. But you're getting half potatoes, half Brussels sprouts in this dish and it is so delicious. So I'll do a bunch of the sides, delicata squash with roasted sage and that could be a whole meal. Right, because then you have you have so much to choose from there. It's such yeah. a bigger, it's actually kind of a bigger meal for everybody. Yeah. yeah. How often do you, I mean, does that seem like a lot of work though when you're preparing a meal like that for a group of people because you're making so many things? You know, it's funny. It's true that when you're preparing a lot of vegetables, there's more slicing and dicing. So if you're just, you know, doing a chicken breast or a piece of fish and a salad, it's less work. It's true. Um, but nowadays in the, in the grocery store, you can get a lot of things already cut or prepped. And so I just, you know, put on some music or put on a podcast and I'm just like slicing and dicing and just kind of make it an entertainment and not a drudgery. Speaking of um, grocery stores, you know, when it comes to produce, do you have rules as to where you get your produce or are you very specific about how that produce comes, what kind of chemicals are maybe used to grow it or anything like that? Well, we, we all follow the um, environmental working groups. They, 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 every year they put out the, um, the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15. And that's a really good guideline because definitely there's certain things that are important to buy organic. And there are other things that aren't quite as important. And because it is expensive and that can be a little bit prohibitive for some people. Um, the things that, that are crucial, that you eat organic, I, that's what I do. And things that you can kind of, you know, just sort of decide what looks best at the grocery store. But I, I, can, I like to sort of pick and choose. And, and I like to actually see what looks the best in the grocery store. And then that's kind of how I'll decide what I'm going to be making. But if you have a farmer's market near you, I'll just, always do just that. Like nothing as good I as greens that. from a farmer market. Mm -hmm. It's like a completely different experience in exactly. terms of eating vegetables. I remember the first time I had a head of lettuce from the farmer's market on a plate with olive oil and balsamic, and it just blew me away. Yeah, I didn't, even, didn't even feel like I was eating salad. It had yeah. such a different crisp flavor. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, I was going to say, I agree with you completely, and we all do. I mean, getting tomatoes when they're just at the oh, height. Um, and didn't often, like tomatoes until... Right, it's almost like a different yeah. vegetable. I hated them growing up. Yeah. 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 Different, they're, they're, they were like, and yeah, exactly. And then you get them from a farmer's market. It's, it's so, so clean and, and nice. Sweet. But that's like, we like to go to the farmer's market and plan our meal based around what's there because it's really a game changer. I mean, the way that the vegetables and produce taste. Yeah. 
Uh, well, I love the book. Uh, congratulations on it. I think we actually have a tweet and a uh, question, though. Hold on a second. Oh. Uh, coming from Twitter, this is, uh, Hey, ladies, I would love to get my daughter into a flexitarian lifestyle, but how would you suggest getting vegetable-hesitant kids to go along? Well, I think it's the way you're cooking the vegetables will make a difference. Uh, if you haven't been roasting your vegetables, try that, because what happens, they get caramelized, so there's a sweetness to them that I think really appeals to kids. I know with my grandkids, uh, they've fallen in love with Brussels sprouts, and I remember trying to introduce Brussels sprouts to my children and how difficult that was. Uh, so I, sometimes it's the way you're cooking them that can make the difference also. Yeah, roasted asparagus was the first oh, vegetable that I ever fell fabulous. in love with when I was like in middle school. Yeah. Uh, any other recommendations? I, I think um, getting your kids in the kitchen with you. Mm. I know that that was, I had a daughter who was very hesitant about eating vegetables. And um, and I started to ask her to cook with me. And I think that, that once you have something invested in it and you want to wait and see how it comes out and then they want to taste it, they start to feel like they're involved in a bigger way. And I think that for me, that's what's really made a difference with my kids. Yeah, absolutely. And then I think as well, taking them to farmer's markets and taking them to grocery stores. Not that kids want to walk around grocery stores that often when they're teenagers, <laughs> but it, it's a great experience, especially the farmer's market, to learn about those things. And they're, you know, the, the people there are more than happy to talk about it. Yeah. Uh, I think we have one question in the audience. Who has a question? Right here. Hello. Um, so I have an online question, and it's, are there any recipes that you really wanted to put in the book that didn't end up making it in? I yes. can remember one. Uh oh, me too. Um, yes. I'm a vegetarian, but my mom and I were remembering a dish that we ate when we were in Jamaica, and it was stuffed chocho or chayote. And we're like, oh, remember, that was so delicious, and we did a lot of research, and it's with chopped meat and breadcrumbs, and we made it, and I couldn't try it to see if it was good or not, because I don't eat meat, but I didn't love the way it smelled, and we're like, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> Another time. <laughs> And there was one that didn't make it in also to the book, uh, mainly because I tried it way too late to get included, and that was um, um, cauliflower that you make and you um, put in a Cuisinart and uh, make it like a mashed potato with butter and with milk and then bake it for a little, maybe with a little cheese. And it's an incredible substitute for potatoes and so healthy. So I was sorry that one just didn't get into the book. There was also um, a watercress soup <laughs> that we attempted a few times, and um, we could just never get it right. It just never tasted as good as we wanted it to be. And if you look now, I think watercress is like the you know, like the superfood right now in terms of nutrients. But we so do have one. We have a watercress, watercress salad, salad yeah. yes, that we have in there. But we just couldn't get it right, so. I attempted a cauliflower rice last week. Oh. And I did, uh, it was okay. You didn't love it? I did not love I mean, I felt like I needed another cauliflower head to give me the amount of rice that I wanted to <laughs> eat. Like it was, it was tasty, but it just didn't have the same... It just didn't fill me up like a, a plate of white rice would, yeah. you know. But it was good. It's tasty. I recommend trying it. You just need a lot of cauliflower. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I love the book. I can't wait to try some of these recipes at home. Congratulations. Uh, Mostly Plants is on shelves now. Everybody give a huge round of applause for Corky, Tracy, Dana, and Lori Pollen for coming in. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.